Good evening and welcome to the second series in the American Cancer Society's Partnering for Life Cancer Education Series. Tonight's focus is breast cancer and we are delighted to facilitate an evening of dialogue around this important topic in collaboration with our national partners who are helping to ensure that we end cancer as we know it for everyone. I am Tawana Thomas Johnson and I have the pleasure and privilege of serving as the Chief Diversity Officer for the American Cancer Society and as moderator for tonight. So we have an information packed webinar. We have some wonderful panelists who are joining us for tonight's discussion. So we're gonna go right ahead and introduce them. Starting us off is Dr. Sharon Allison Adi, who is an energetic and engaging speaker, author, health educator, physician and health strategist consultant. She is the CEO of Calden Inc. and Beautiful Woman Inside and Out. She serves as the health strategist for several national organizations and develops and oversees programmatic agendas with long and short-term strategies ensuring effectiveness and achievements of goals. Dr. Sharon, as we affectionately call her, is active with numerous medical, political, and civic organizations. She has served on the board of trustees of the National Medical Association and as chair of the Council on the Concerns of Women Physicians. Because of her colorful and the down-to-earth manner in which she addresses health and wellness, among other topics, she is a highly sought-after speaker. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sharon. Hi, Tawana. It's so wonderful to be back with the American <laughs> Cancer Society. So great. Well, I don't know that you ever leave us, Dr. Sharon. I never do. You're Not a right, week goes exactly. by. Hand in glove. Hand in glove. That's right. All right. Well, our next panelist is also hand in glove with the American Cancer Society, and that is Miss Ricky Fairley, who is an award-winning marketing veteran that has transformed her business acumen into breast cancer advocacy. Ricky co-founded and serves as CEO of Touch, the Black Breast Cancer Alliance, to address Black breast cancer as a unique and special disease state with the overall goal of reducing the mortality rate for Black women. Ricky founded and served as co-host for The Doctor Is In, a weekly live breast cancer advocacy web series on the blackdoctor.org Facebook page that reaches over 3 million viewers. In January of 2022, she started the When We Trial movement to change the game on Black women participating in clinical trials to improve outcomes for Black women with breast cancer. And she is one of our breasties. Please welcome Ricky Fairley. Hey, everyone. So blessed to be here. Thank you for having me. Great to see you, my Tawana. <laughs> Good to be with you. And our next panelist is Wanda Blakely, who was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer in 2010. She had a total of 11 surgeries. In her words, Wanda has said, before cancer, I was a very outgoing and hardworking single mother. I have two kids. My daughter was in the army. My son was in high school at the time. All I wanted was to see my son graduate high school. It was a long journey for me. I wouldn't be here telling my story if it wasn't for the American Cancer Society. At the time of my diagnosis, I had no insurance, which meant no treatment or surgery. The American Cancer Society made sure I got state insurance in less than 10 days. This is why I will always be an advocate for the ACS. I was given a second chance at life and to help other women. Wanda is now a 12-year breast cancer survivor. I think we ought to start right there with a hand. <laughs> <of survivors. laughs> Welcome, so ladies. Here. <laughs> oh, we are so excited to have you here. Well, ladies, I know that we've got a lot that we want to talk about, and we don't have a whole lot of time tonight, so we're going to dive right in. Dr. Sharon, if I may, I would love to start with you. If you could just sort of do a level set around breast cancer 101. What is breast cancer? What are we, what should we be thinking about in terms of signs and symptoms? What should we be thinking about in terms of screening guidelines? And also what is the impact on black women? Right, right, right. So let's just jump right in. Cancer, let's just start with cancer itself. Cancer is not the invasion of a bacteria or a virus or a foreign being coming into your body. It's not spooky like that. It is a cell in your body. I say we all have some crazy cousins. That cousin goes a little crazy, 
cause some other cousins around, then you have a tumor. It just gets a little off. It, it is a mutation. And that's big medical school word for it goes off, right? And then has some friends come, then you have a lump or a tumor. Cancer is wherever it starts. So breast cancer obviously means that it starts in the breast. Now, who's at risk for breast cancer? Do you have breast? I don't care if it's a triple A or Z triple Z. It does not matter. If you have breasts, you're at risk for breast cancer, black, white, pink, or green, or blue, right? So now, the other part is we do also know that men get breast cancer in much lower rates, but we have to give a shout out for that. And those are, particularly men, are more tied to genetics. Now, notice when we talk about who's at risk, I started where? I started if you have breasts. Yes, there is a family risk factor, but that is actually not the leading. Number one, if you ever had breast cancer before, if you are obese, if you have had radiation to the chest, all of these different things are risk factors for breast cancer, hormone replacement therapy for prolonged times. If you started your period before the age of 12, if you started menopause late, your first child after 30, all of those are risk factors. And I encourage you to go to uh, cancer.org for great credible, somebody put in the chat, wherever medium you're looking at, credible information, because there's a lot of junk out there, but you want credible information. Certainly genetics plays a factor, but only about five to 10% of breast cancer. Then, And some of us believe that may be trending high. There's a genetic uh, predisposition, but this is what we must know. If you have breasts, get them checked and be aware of your risk. Now, most breast cancers are going to occur in women in their 60s. However, women less than 45, young women often have breast cancer and it's very aggressive. We're going to get into the types and all of that. What should I do? People say, well, what are symptoms of breast cancer? Somebody write this in the chat. Nothing. First and foremost, Many women will find out that they have breast cancer by going to get their routine mammogram. And that is great because you don't have now a major golf ball sized lump that's all of a sudden there and, and, and it's probably spread or metastasized by the time you have a late diagnosis. So number one, get your mammograms and the recommendations, you should talk to your doctor, but also generally we know the age groups and we're gonna talk about that when you should start getting your mammograms. So number one risk, the number one issue or symptom of breast cancer is nothing. Number two, a lump that does not go away for say four to six weeks and it is firmed, it is fixed or a lump under your arm or scaling on the skin of the breast or the nipple turns inward or starts to produce a fluid. Those are top line. We're gonna get into all the specifics and I'm looking forward to answering questions and really doing some real talk about breast cancer, what we can do, prevention, <clears throat> early detection, and you can live, 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 live with breast cancer, but let's get to it. All right. Well, I love that because we want to leave with that message. You can live, you can survive. And we've got two amazing survivors that are part of this panel. So that is certainly, this is an evening of information, education, inspiration, and hope. So we want folks to leave with that message. So I want to bring it home just a little bit to Black women because the folks that are partnering with us on our Partnering for Life uh, education series, which is all about raising awareness in the Black community, are certainly some of our leading women women's organization, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and the Lynx Incorporated are among the many partners that are bringing this event to you tonight. So Ricky, can you tell us a little bit, and I'll come back to you for the same, Dr. Sherry, what, uh, Sharon, what contributes to the higher rates of Black women getting and dying from breast cancer? Well, you know, we have a 41% higher mortality rate we have than white women, we have a 39% higher recurrence rate than white women, which is crazy, right? Black women under 30 are getting breast cancer at four times the rate of white women. 
Black women under 35 are getting breast cancer at twice the rate, dying at three times the rate, well before they would have that first mammogram at age 40. And so when you're dying, at the, when you get it at that age, you don't know. We have dense breasts, and um, but you don't know you have dense breasts until you get that first mammogram. So if you're 30, you get breast cancer, you don't know about it, right? Um, but, but now we also have a growing body of data that's validating that a black breast cancer cell looks different from a white breast cancer cell. And frankly, all of the protocols, all of the drugs that we have as standard of care were all done on white bodies. So the drugs that we're taking were never tested on black women. The protocols that we're dealing with, like the age of a mammogram, doesn't matter for doesn't work for black women. Um, the protocol that you know a lumpectomy and a, and radiation is equivalent to a mastectomy was tested in, was was that study was done in Sweden. So we don't have the data and the science for black women, and so we're dying at younger ages. We're getting it at later stages. And it's just a horrible place to be for Black women. It's really the most fatal disease that Black women face. It's a life or death situation for us. And a lot of the, even the risk factors, like 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 breastfeeding, if someone they say breast, if you breastfeed your babies, you won't get breast breast cancer. Well, I breastfed my babies. I had the triple triple A version of the boobs, Doctor Jim. So so um, but um, so like things like that. What you know, some women can't breastfeed, right? They work someplace where they can't pump. They are. They have a baby in a hospital where the nursing staff isn't isn't big enough to help them learn how to do their you know, to nurse their babies. So, that we have all these factors that are against us. And sometimes, a lot of times, we wait a long time. We get that diagnosis and we wait before we do anything because we're scared. We don't have. We don't trust our doctor. We don't have childcare. We don't have someone to take care of our mothers. Mm-hmm. You know, seventy seven point three percent of Black moms are single moms. So, what's that mama going to do? She's not going to get her mammogram today. She's going to go to work to feed her kids. She's not going to go to chemo today because she's got to take care of her mom or her, or her grandma. And so all these factors are in place. And so we need better science for Black women. We need better science. And and until we really and you know think about what the science is. And so I've been on this mission to really bring bring this concept of Black breast cancer as a distinct and different disease state to pharma and say, what are you going to do for us? And frankly, I don't want anybody to die of breast cancer, but I want I want mortality rate parity for Black women, and we deserve that standard of care. And we know that that doctors aren't inviting us into clinical trials, into research. And even when we bring it up to them, our research shows that that we still walk away not having a good understanding of what that's all about. Mm-hmm. And really, the research fears are it's fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to get the guinea. I'm going to be a guinea pig. I think I'm going to get the sugar pill and die. We don't know what we don't know. The level of health and literacy in our community is is crazy. And it's really because we don't talk about it at home. We don't talk about health. You know, we don't talk about health at the kitchen table until Uncle Pookie gets his leg amputated or Grandma Eve is in the hospital. Well, how'd that happen? And so we're not talking about it. We're not educating ourselves about it. And so when we get that C thing, it's like fear comes over us because we just don't know. We don't even know what, what we don't know. And so so we've got to figure out how to educate Black women, but also help them, teach them to advocate for themselves and demand the standard of care they deserve. And, you know, Tawana, we live in this world of um, health and equity. We don't have health equity. And we're not going to get to health equity until all health care providers, the whole ecosystem, practices the golden rule. What your mother taught you when you you were two years old, treat others as you want to be treated. And so when patients come to me and say, what do you think about this treatment plan? So we'll go back and ask your doctor if that's what they would recommend for their mom or their grandma or their auntie or their daughter. Because if it's not good enough for them, it's not good enough for you. And we have to demand that level of care because we're not getting it right now. And, and we're only going to get it by educating each other. And, and I've learned through my research that, you know, we don't trust doctors. We don't trust researchers. We don't trust pharma companies. Who do we trust? <clears throat> we trust black women. We trust other breasties. And so I want to make sure that our breastie community knows what they need to know so they can educate their sisters. And you know, the breastie club, it's not when you want to join. I wouldn't recommend it. But once you're in it, we have this unconditional sisterhood, this unconditional love and trust for each other. And that's where the information is getting getting communicated. So we're trying to use our network to help other breasties understand, you know, how to do this work. I want to jump in. um, And and certainly, Ricky, that was great. I want to jump in. You know, certainly as a physician, 
um, and understanding that, yes, I mean, I've done my work in cultural competency and health literacy now for two decades, and that is the ability to get away from doctor speak. So I teach doctors how to speak English. Right. And I speak Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I teach patients how to take on and be advocates, but you know, this is not going to happen in a year, five years, 10 years, or a generation. And so one thing, and I was talking last night on a panel, let me also just hit it between the eyes. I don't want us to blame women for late diagnosis. Right, no. Yes. No. No. We don't go as African, let's let's clean up our house first. Sisters, we need to get our mammograms done. I'm so glad yeah. that the sororities and the partners are there, the churches are there and all of that. So we need the messages on Sunday. We need the sororities to go in mass. You know, Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority has a van. Right. Uh, all of that. Those are wonderful. And but let we, me interject, Dr. Sharon. We need it beyond the month of October. Right. Yes. Every round. And you know, we all talk about breast cancer year round. Year round. And, and we need 3D. We need 3D mammograms. We need yeah. 3D And we do need 3D mammograms, but I just need a sister to think mammogram. Right. I need you to think right. I'm gonna get a mammogram. Right. I am going to think about my breasts. The other part of this though is also so yes, all of this, and we'll talk about what we have to do. I need sisters to put on some sneakers. Mm -hmm. I need I us to know that obesity and the link to nutrition and obesity, there is a link to breast cancer, colon cancer, and others. But the other part is, and I gave a, a workshop last night on racial bias and unconscious bias and implicit bias in our healthcare system. So I need us to think about it, your husband and your partners to think about it. Right. And as we go into the health community and to interface with the healthcare system. I am not saying that the healthcare system overarching is racist. I am saying that there is bias and all of us have bias. Right, Black all of us have, have bias. bias. Black nurses have bias. We all have bias. We all have it. So when you recognize that, you say that walking in the sister that is the single mom that is a bit younger, there may be some bias and judgment in, should right. I recommend this, this, and this? Should right. this person be... I, open up a clinical trial, but how do we combat bias with education and empowerment? If I told you there was a coupon for a free Krispy Kreme donut, and if you had the coupon and you turned it in, you get the Krispy Kreme, you would tear up Krispy Kreme right. if they did not give you that donut. I want us to be so passionate mm -hmm. about our health that we say, I want to know if there's a clinical trial. Should, what type of breast cancer right. do I have? And then take someone with you. And so I think that that's when we talk about Black women and breast cancer, let's look at our house. Number one, there are some preventive right. factors that we need to do. Alcohol use, tobacco use, obesity, nutrition, those things. But preventive screening. And then don't wait on the doctor to call you about your mammogram. No. Don't wait on, oh, wait six months for a biopsy. You don't know the results. The Lord is going to fix it. Right. No tenaciously go after your health. Thank you. I totally agree. And that's a, that's a lot of the work we're doing is teaching women to stand up and say, hold yes, on, right. wait a minute. And we have one breast that says, I don't want the, the McDonald drive through appointment today. I want the Ruth Chris appointment today. I want <laughs> all the things. So take your hand off the door and stay with me and talk to me, doctor. That's what we have to demand, you know? Absolutely. Access to quality care, not yeah. just care, but quality care. So thank you, Dr. Sharon and Ricky. I want to bring Wanda into this uh, conversation because Wanda, certainly this has been your lived experience, right? You have walked oh, yeah. this journey and you are here to tell us about it. So talk to us a little bit about your story and your path to survivorship. And then also, you know, I'd love for you to sort of weigh in on the on the topics, the points that Dr. Sharon and Ricky have made around Black women and sometimes the barriers, right? There are a lot of barriers oh, yeah. that we have when it comes <clears throat> to not only accessing care, but being compliant, mm -hmm. right, with treatment right. plans. Right. And, it, and sometimes it's it, it's irrespective of socioeconomic status. So let's start there. I met Dr. Sharon years ago when mm -hmm. she did the largest women's health event that I had ever been to. 
a very affluent African-American church. I did a workshop for her and I asked the question of the sisters that were in the room and it was packed at eight o'clock in the morning. There had to be at least 400 women in the room. And I said, I want you to raise your hand if you are up to date on your mammograms. I can tell you that almost half the room did not raise their hand. Yet outside of that church building in the parking lot, Mercedes, Mercedes, right, Audi, right. Lexus. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's not, you know, we like to sometimes think that it's just an issue about not. the underserved and it isn't. So Wanda, mm-hmm. I'm going to turn it to you to tell us your story and to talk a little bit about the barriers. Well, my biggest barrier, I was young when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I believe I was 39. And what made me found out that something was wrong because I always gave myself self-exam, whether it's in the shower, if I'm laying down in my bed. So one night I was laying laying down, I'm giving myself an exam and I felt something that was never there before. To the touch, it hurt and it made me felt very sick, like nauseous. I said, something is not right here. And the next day I called my doctor because I was concerned. Everyone is like telling me, oh, it's nothing. Oh, God would take care of it. But um, I made sure I made an appointment without the doctor investigating to find out what it was. The surgeon said, oh, it's just a cyst. So I went in for surgery thinking, oh, it's just a cyst. No tests. And a week later, he comes in and he tell me it's cancer. And I didn't have a doctor that had bedside manners. It was like, he's telling me something and I'm not hearing anything else. Everything is just like I became deaf because I believe I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there like, am I going to die? Am I going to live? Because he said, I don't know what to tell you. It's cancer. So at that time, I did have insurance. In my journey to investigate whether um, I wanted to get second opinion, third opinion, because everyone told me, um, you're going to have to get a mastectomy, a complete mastectomy. And, and then I didn't have insurance. That was my number one struggle. I didn't have insurance. So everything stopped for about four months. Nothing was done for me. And meanwhile, cancer is attacking my body. The pain I went through and they couldn't do nothing for me. Um, I decided to just become more spiritual and educate myself. And I was determined to see my baby boy graduate from high school. I started fighting. I didn't want nobody to feel sorry for me because I don't like the self-pity thing. And I kept it like to a minimum because I really didn't want people to know because a lot of time when people know you're sick, You get this, you know, like, oh, I'm so, no, I want strong people around me. And that's what I did. I finally got the insurance. Thanks to American Cancer Society. They helped me. They filled out the paperwork. And then I started getting tests to find out. Biopsy never was done before. And I can honestly say my daughter was there beside me. She left Georgia, came back to New York and helped me through this. My son left Georgia and graduated up here in New York. And we went through this together. And it was very, very hard because from August all the way to December, I still didn't know what stage until I had the surgery. And then after the surgery, they said, okay, we found out you have ductile, invasive ductile 
carcinoma stage two. And um, a few years prior to that, I had a hysterectomy. And at that time, I didn't know why is this happening to me? But my oncologist told me if I didn't have that hysterectomy, I wouldn't have made it because the, the type of cancer I had beat off of hormones. And by me being in menopause, it just stayed stationary right there in my breasts and it didn't spread to any lip nodes. So after the remover of cancer, it was complications after complication. No one prepared me for this. Um, I wish there was a, a, a book to tell you, okay, I thought I was going to have one surgery and I'm done. I had infections and then a doctor doesn't understand my pigmentation and he did things wrong. Like I said, when you don't have good insurance, you're treated differently. But when you have the best of insurance, you treat it with quality health care. So it was a struggle and I finally made it through it. 2014 was my last surgery. And after that, I didn't realize that I was going to be someone to help someone else. I remember going to park my car one morning and I saw a neighbor walking and she was so sad. And I was like, what's wrong? She was like, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and they told me I have to lose both of my breasts. And I said, guess what? You're going to be a survivor. You know why? I'm going to be right here to help you. And I can say to this day, she's still living. She survived. And I stood by her. And not only her, a few other people have called me. And I've been a great help, encourage, coach, whatever they need me for, to listen, to educate, whatever I can find out for them. Because I told them, I said, when you don't know, the American Cancer Society, they have a lot of answers to your questions, support groups from there, help me. And then I told them to call and they did. And I can honestly say that mm -hmm. August 10th, I'm 12 years survivor and I'm still here surviving. And I have my mammogram next month on the 9th. Every year I get a mammogram. So I always tell everybody, okay, it's painful, <laughs> but I like to know because if I didn't follow through, call my doctor, I probably wouldn't be here today telling my story because it took me going to the doctor. And a lot of people don't like to go to the doctor, but I'm going to add that. At my job, it was this one young lady. She was 26 years old. And I went to her. She had breast cancer. And I asked her and I said to her, I said, what was the symptoms? Because I want to know. And if she didn't tell me what her symptoms were, I don't think I would have paid attention to my body because she didn't make it. But by her telling me what to do, what she ignored, because remember you said earlier, doctor, about the nipple, she had pus coming out her nipple and she did not do anything about it. But I'm just glad I did listen to her mm -hmm. and I'm here today to tell my story. So a lot of women, they don't want to get their breasts removed because of their partner or, oh, I'm too young. You want to live. Life goes on. Right. So right. Right. that's why I'm here to just encourage your health is first. Put you first, right. not someone else's feeling. Because a lot of young girls, 
come to me and I tell them, I said, listen, take care of your health. If they say, get it removed, get it removed. You get a new one. I did. And I'm happy. (laughs) We love that, Wanda. Thank you so much for sharing your, your testimony for us. I know that there is someone that is listening, that is watching, that was inspired by your resilience. And, you know, it's such a wonderful Uh, testimony of turning one's pain into purpose, right? So there, you know, it's not an easy journey. It's not a journey any of us would ever want to walk. But if that is the path that, for whatever reason, the creator gives us to walk, you can turn that pain into purpose and encourage others and inspire others and educate others, right? So I want to get to Dr. Sharon uh, to talk a little bit about what we do after, what one should do, men or women, because we want to also acknowledge, as you said earlier, Dr. Sharon, that men do get breast cancer, what we should do after we get a breast cancer diagnosis. And then I want to come back to Ricky, because Ricky has started this incredible movement. It really is quite the revolution around diversity in clinical trials. So Ricky, I want to come back to you to talk about the data. And I know you've got a great video that we want to share with the viewers. So Dr. Sharon, what should we do after we get a breast cancer diagnosis? Number one, take a deep breath, okay? For all of our rah-rah, the pink, the, the, oh, we're sisterhood and all of that, this is deep, y'all, right? What, no matter what the diagnosis is, it's deep. So number one, take a deep breath. Number two, if you don't understand, because you're going to be, when you're told, it's like most people say, well, I didn't hear anything else but cancer. I don't know what all they said about radiation did surge. I don't know. I just heard cancer. And then you immediately think, oh my God, I'm going to die. Right? Okay. Take a deep breath. This is a problem that we face. How are we strategically going to go about taking on this problem? So if that means you have to make another appointment at the doctor, which I do recommend, and you will have a team with you. Not just, you know, one-on-one with your doctor, but the team. Eventually, you will have a team. Talk to your primary care physician. Say an oncologist diagnosed you, but you have a great relationship with your OBGYN, your internist, your family physician. Go ahead and make that appointment. And yes, you don't have to have have a problem to see your primary care. You can say, I just want to have a discussion. Two, you need a team. Three, find somebody in your life that's going to walk it out with you, that you trust, whether that's a family member or you may not can stand your sister and your kids can be crazy and you don't want them, but you got a good sister girlfriend that is going to advocate with you, hug you, cry with you, let you fall out, but then pick you back up and say, okay, how are we going to do it? So find that and look at your healthcare benefits. I love that Wanda talked about that. But also know in sidebar, in the United States, any state that you're in, there are free mammograms for you, free pap smears for you. So look at your healthcare and what, what things are there. Look at these centers. This is key. The centers that are there, and Ricky's going to talk about clinical trials, look at the cancer.org should be probably the third thing you do for valid information. Boom, just type in, I just got breast cancer diagnosis, what's next? You will see a plethora, a whole bunch of great information. And then get your support system together, get your healthcare business together, your family business together, and now go take it on. So you would go get diagnosed. If your doctor says, okay, we're going to do a biopsy now, or we need to stage it, learn all you can from credible, somebody put it in the chat on Facebook, YouTube, credible sources, get a second opinion. You can ask for a second opinion. And guess what? A good doctor does not mind you getting a second opinion. Because guess what? We often go in the back and call somebody and say, look, I got this going on. What you think? Okay. All right. So get a second opinion, but also feel comfortable with your care team. Okay. Those are the first things to want it that I would do and keep doing. Go buy a pink notebook and write notes 
ask for your medical records, ask for copies of your tests. This is now your second or first job because it's your health. It is now something that we have to do strategically. So Dr. Sharon, I so appreciate your comments and I also appreciate you amplifying the American Cancer Society's resources. We have a ton of resources for individuals facing uh, cancer diagnosis. So please know that we are a trusted and reliable source. Yes. And we are here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can call us, you can go to the website and the information and support is there. And Wanda is a wonderful testimony to the type of support that the ACS provides. But before I go to Ricky, Dr. Sharon, I do want to ask you, because I know that we've got members of the faith community who are watching mm -hmm. tonight. Oh, yes. And there is, you know, I love to talk about spirituality and health. That's one of my favorite topics. And I, the reason I love to talk about it is a real intersection, right? So talk to us about the role of spirituality when it comes to, you know, dealing with something like a, a diagnosis. And let's talk about whether or not, you know, our faith is, you know, is it integrated and in support of Excellent. our health and wellness or are they not so much? No, well, you know, we have done so many church programs together. As you know, I am a good AME, born Baptist AME officer tongue-talking, Bible-toting, right? And before all of that, uh, as a woman of faith, if my toenail hurt, I'm going to God. I may see the podiatrist, but first I'm going to God. And th this is key and this is no judgment because if you're not a person of faith, this is not a resource for you. However.com, if you are a person of faith, Luke wrote part of the New Testament. Guess what? The first priest, were doctors. So there is no disconnection between religion and science, right? We are connected. And so this is this is what we have to talk about. The faith community right now in October, I know at my church, we all wear in ribbons. We have a jazz concert tomorrow with benefits going to breast cancer. The faith community has really mobilized, and we've done a lot of that work with the Kosher Foundation and American Cancer Society, where the faith community has breast cancer support groups, has breast cancer Sunday, prostate cancer Sunday, all of that. If there is are persons in your church, um, and, and if there's a health ministry, just contact the health ministry. Number one, wrap that in. But before you go to the church, before you go out, if has a person of faith, go all up in the Bible or whatever your religious teaching is, because most religions have a piece that, that is in science. And know that it is not medicine or prayer. It is both. I did research as a fellow that showed that you don't even have to pray for yourself. There are studies that show if people are praying for you, whether you're a person of faith or not, study out of Hopkins that showed that people that were prayed for got better than people that were not. So now let's talk about you and the peace and the calmness and the mental health associated with this journey. Often faith is the fountain from which we draw, as well as talk to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but your faith is an integral part. And I love the fact that most Black churches, because that is my reality, most churches, Black and white, but most churches have pieces. And if it's one in eight women get breast cancer, you got more than eight women in the congregation. Somebody in your congregation has had breast cancer and we can talk about it. So yes, it is not faith or medicine. God, I believe, has a woman of faith. That aspirin for your headache or your heart disease. I believe somebody didn't know him, wasn't thinking about him, was inspired by him to get the chemotherapy, the radiation, the treatment to you. You think, and your doctor, if they're not a believer, may think it's them, but actually pray for your doctors. Pray right. for their hands to be the hands of God, your nurses, your staff, the radiation oncologist to you. And, and I just believe that all healing, whether it's medical, or divine, instant, comes from God. And I'm a woman of faith. So embrace that. And let your doctor know, and this is all I have to say, because we want to know. We Many of us, won't, you won't bring it up. But let your doctor know, no, my faith is very important to me. And so, yes, feel free to pray with me if you want to. Feel free to do X, Y, and Z. And often you will open up the door. And many breast cancer 
um, survivors have actually led healthcare teams to Christ themselves. Did that answer your question? You know, I like to put, I like to talk you, about You things. answered that question. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Sharon and I have been doing this for a long, long time. time. Long time. Well, I want to go back to uh, Ricky because uh, Ricky, you, you started <laughs> us down the path of talking about the importance of diversity in clinical trials. And you have really started such an incredible movement um, that all of us need to get behind. And we want to make sure that we put um, your information in the chat and on Facebook so that folks can access your re your website and get some of your resources related to diversity in clinical trials. So why is it important and why aren't we doing it? We have to do it. And, and um, first, I got to say that faith got me here. You know, my doctor gave me two years to live. I had triple negative metastatic breast cancer and I went on some experimental drugs and I didn't die, and it's been 11. So I know God put me on this faith book and gave me my purpose. And I know a lot of people prayed for me to live. So thank you, God, for that. Thank you, God, for, for that testament, because it is, you know, I prayed I prayed for my chemo every day. I prayed <laughs> with all my doctors. So thank you, God, for that. But, but we have to advance the science. We have to get better drugs for us, and we have to do the work. So I'm just going to show you my video, because I think that kind of tells a story but we started this movement um, earlier this year. And since May 15th, we've signed up 4,000 Black women for clinical trials. And that sounds like a good number, but it's not because we have so much more to go. But I think my video will give a good picture of, um, of um, you know, what we need to do and what we're doing. Oops, let's see where am I going? When we trial, we make a difference in breast cancer research. When we trial, we save black lives. When we trial, we defy the odds. When we trial, we do it for our sisters. When we trial, we do it for our daughters and our sons. When we trial, we set a new standard of care. I was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. I was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer at 19 years old. I was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer at 38. All you hear is cancer, cancer, cancer. You never think about um, what the doctor's saying. Then the doctor looked at me and he said, did you hear what I said? And I said, yeah but I don't know how to be a breast cancer patient. The numbers for black women are devastating. Black women have a 41% higher mortality rate than white women. Black women have a 39% higher recurrence rate than white women. Black women get triple negative breast cancer, the worst one, at three times the rate of white women. So we're getting breast cancer younger at later stages and earlier ages, and it's just devastating, it's unacceptable. I know my grandma had it and she beat it. And so I just knew that that was going to be me as well. So I think then um, my fight started was when I realized, OK, I'm up for the fight for my life. So she said, well, you know, I got this good clinical trial. You can go on it as a second phase. And um, she said, I think it'll work for you. But the first thing I asked her was like, am I going to be a guinea pig? you know, because of our, you know, history with the black culture. Over the years, clinical trials for many African-Americans have been hocus pocus. So, you know, we know about Tuskegee and Henrietta Lacks. Clinical trial is no longer a dirty word. It is, um, it's a halo opportunity. It's a message from God. It's an opportunity for you to live past this moment. But we need to get more African-Americans into clinical trials because 
We are dying at alarming rates, and we have to stop this. We really do. And right now, there's only a 3% participation rate in clinical trials. And so even the drugs that we're making now, there's no black bodies being tested. As we built when we trial, we tried really hard to make it for breasties, by breasties, about breasties, so people could see themselves in what we're doing. Clinical trials are important. This is top-notch research that we need to have as a black community. It's like a butterfly effect. We all gotta help each other out in one way to get to the ultimate end goal. And I think the onus is on us that are cancer survivors to tell the story. And the least that we could do is be on a trial. But how about for your children? Mm. And for your children's children, we got to do this thing. We got to save lives. It's just that important. So we, we took a lot of the research that we collected to really build the words on our website. And um, when we trial that organ, we now have a video for each one of those breasties in that story. So I, I put our, I'm putting our YouTube channel in the chat. You can kind of read about all of them or listen to videos for all of them. Um, but we really just took what people told us and turned it into language that would work and that we, we know we could convince black women to do trials. And um, we are, you know, we, we did a big media campaign. Thank you, Pharma, for a lot of money to do media. And we we reached out first to our breastie community because we wanted to make sure they could talk to each other with the right information. And then we did a radio campaign in 10 cities to on hip hop stations to young black women because we want young black women to start these conversations with their mamas and their aunties and their grandmas. And then we hit the road. And so we, we've done 17 events since May all over the country trying to catch women off guard, you know, at the Essence Fest. And this, we were on the street by the casino. Um, we did a Black Women Talk Tech event. We did Urban League Convention. We did we did Lynx Convention, Lynx Assembly. Um, but we're trying to go where Black women live, work, play, pray, and slay to get this message out by any means necessary. And now we're trying to scale it by partnering with other organizations. And we have a bunch of videos. We have breasties that are hitting the road with us. We're doing an HBCU homecoming tour. I'm going to Atlanta tomorrow to go to Spellhouse, Morehouse. Haley's, my daughter's doing Howard. We're going to FAMU next week, but we're trying to get out into the world and be and catch people off guard. We're actually doing better in churches and in places where they're not really thinking about health. It's not a health fair, but like, oh my God, what are you, what are you talking about, cancer? And then we catch them off guard and they listen to us. And so we have this great army of breasts, as I call them, our untouchables. And they're helping me hit the road. We're going everywhere we can to, you know, bring this message to the world. But to, in order to scale it, we need more help. We need more people to talk about it and share our videos. And so we're doing it. We have a lot more work to do, but we've got to get better drugs for our disease. It's a different disease and we deserve it. And if there is, I just want to jump in, if there is a benefit to COVID, yes. one of the benefits that we have seen is the acceptance or openness yes. to clinical trials, particularly in communities of color. I've been, we've been talking about clinical trial diversity for over 25 years, I know, I know in my own career, but yes. And we, I know I see a lot of questions in the chat or whatever, so I'm gonna be quiet right now. But and I think you're right with COVID um, and, you know, even George Floyd had brought health disparities to the table, but, right, right, right. Um, but, you know, we can't be afraid anymore because we're dying. And we don't need to die of breast cancer. Black women do not need to be dying of this disease. So we have to do this work, you know. So, Ricky, I want that to be our, our call to action, right? So, again, what, what you are doing is a movement and you've created resources. You know, many of us are part of organizations. We're part of church communities. Mm -hmm. We're part of PTAs and other community-based organizations. How can we get involved? If you go to our website, whenwetrial.org, we have a thing you can join our movement and you'll start to get emails and information. Um, we have a YouTube channel called when we, it's a, our YouTube handle is at touch BBCA. And if you mm -hmm. go on there, we have a, a channel with these videos. We have six up there now. We're about to put four more up 
You can share the videos. If you go to our website and our Instagram and our our Instagram and our Facebook, we, there's plenty of content to share. We try to bring all the facts about Black breast cancer to the table, and um, and come you know come hang with us. If you want to go events with us, we are going. We're everywhere. We're we're doing a special event at SABCS. Um, but we're going to churches. We're going to um, we're, we have we actually have a, um, a toolkit for pastors' wives. Mm-hmm. What do you do when you get sick? You call your pastor, right? You pray with your pastor, and then you say, "Pastor, what do I do?" And he doesn't know what to do, or she doesn't know what to do, and they usually send send it to the pastor's wife, right, or or the health ministry. So we make toolkits for churches. So here's what the, here are the tools you need to have to know to learn about breast cancer and clinical trials and and screening and all the all the things, right? Um, and we have a young women's initiative where we're, make, we're creating tools. It's called For the Love of Your Girls, spelled G-U-R-L-S. We have plenty of materials about that, teaching young women how to check their breasts and, and how to talk to their friends about breast cancer. So call me, email me. I'll put my, my email in the chat. We're happy to talk to everybody. We really want to just get the word. And we need your help. We need everyone to sort of focus on this. And you know what, Dr. Sharon? We have been talking about diversity and clinical trials for years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Talking, 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 talking. But we're walking. I'm done with talking. Yeah. I want to walk, walk. I'm in three trials right now. My self behavioral trials. We have to do this, and so um, That's right. we have. To, and and you know, also to want to, I I go to the seat. I take my seat at the table with the pharma companies every day, and mm-hmm. I'm not afraid to say your baby's a little ugly, but we're gonna help you out because the materials that they have to 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 explain trials are not good. Yeah, you know, they we can't see ourselves in them, and and we need cultural humility. What does that mean? That means how are you making people feel? How are you making people feel? If your materials aren't making people feel safe and secure and good and educated and informed and confident that this is something they can do, it's not good enough. And so we're, you know, we're we're getting a great response from our pharma partners. We're so grateful. We actually have a nurse navigator on our team. So she will help you walk you through a trial, help you deal with the informed consent, help educate your families. And so she can be a resource and, we're, and she's a resource to our pharma partners. We're working on about six trials right now, helping them educate patients and, and designing the recruiting materials. You know, I'm a marketing person by trade. Well, no, your, your marketing genius is coming through, Ricky, loud and clear. <laughs> like, we're giving that. We saw it in the video. And I also want to know who did the glam because the glam was really, really good. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. You know I don't wear makeup, girl. Yes. Don't wear makeup for me. But, um, but no, um, we really, you know, we're just trying to do the right thing by our women, by our sisters. And we can only do it. You know, Oz is over there. And we got, you know, everybody, there's no breast cancer. We got to walk arm in arm down in all of our lanes to get there. And you guys are doing awesome work and we're trying to partner with everybody, you know. So, you know, my oldest granddaughter, Belle, is five. And so she has a, a baby, she has two baby sisters, but the baby is 18 months. She's still nursing. So we were in the, we're always either naked or in bikinis because, you know, I live at the beach. And so we were in the shower uh, in July, I guess the summer. And, and she's like, so Debbie, my grandma name is Debbie. So Debbie, how come you don't have those things on your boobs that baby heart sucks on? And I said, well, those are nipples and they got really sick and they got my boobs really sick and we had to cut them off. And I spent the next hour explaining breast cancer to her. I told her, I showed her, showed her pictures of my boobs. I told her everything except that I was going to die. You know, I told her everything. We had this great conversation. Of course, she immediately went to school and told the whole class that her, her <laughs> mama has fake breasts, whatever. But you know what? I don't want to have any more conversations with her about breast cancer. I want that to be, mm, that's I don't want it to be in her vocabulary. I don't want her to think about it. So I got about 10 years to do this work to get rid of this. So she won't ever get it. She's my, they're my purpose, my babies. And so we have to talk about it. We have to bring these conversations to the table. And, and with our men, we have to talk about prostate cancer. We have to talk about colon cancer. Mm-hmm. We have to bring these conversations home and, and, you know, deprive people of food to, to talk about it like I do. You know, on Thanksgiving, you can't eat the turkey until you tell me what your PSA is <laughs> or, 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 your, or then you yeah. have your man this year. And, and, you know, make these conversations happen with our young people. We have this HBCU internship program and we asked our, ask our interns to have, make a video with their mom. It's the first time in their lives they've ever talked to their moms about breasts. We're on 37 interns now. They don't talk about it. And then they re- get really proud of themselves because we have them post on social media for 10 weeks. And at the end of the 10 weeks, they have their friends making TikTok videos of self exams and how to do it. And they're so proud of themselves that they've made an impact in their community. So I want to make that, I want to scale that all over the world. So. 
I love it. I love it. And I know that, you know, uh, there's so much, right, that needs to be done in terms of education and policy and the whole clinical trials piece. Like you, Ricky, I sit on a number of advisory boards with companies where these conversations are happening about um, not only the design of the collateral, but the design of the trials and the The study. trial itself, yeah. Right. Right. So where, where are you going to have the trials? What cities are you going to? Where you know, but every aspect of the ecosystem has to have help, needs help. But there's absolutely. a lot of other things, and so you know, we kind of like you know, take a piece. What chunk can I deal with today? And we got to we got to make it happen. Absolutely. Well, ladies, we are very very close to time, and we've got a couple of questions that have come in, and so I want to make sure that. The honor those to the extent that we can. And so, Dr. Sharon, this one is for you. And the question is, my mammogram didn't catch my breast cancer. What other tests should we ask our doctors for? Great. So I get asked all the time, MRI, which is out there versus mammogram versus ultrasound. Let me be clear. The gold standard remains the mammogram, but then there are 3D mammograms um, and different types of mammograms. Tech, technically, uh, you could have an MRI, but the MRI can come up with false negatives. So it is partnership. It is not just one necessarily. So your mammogram, three, make sure it's 3D mammogram, uh, ultrasound, MRIs, all of those are modalities that are used. Uh, and then also, if, and the big shout out for us as women, If you are told to come back in three months for a follow-up, six months for a follow-up mammogram, I I say go ahead and schedule it right then and make it three months right then. I had a scare myself, Dr. Sharon talking about cancer, had a mammogram. It was like, huh? Right then I said, okay, I need an ultrasound. Let's do an ultrasound. Okay. Now let's do a a biopsy Right. right now to ask and to advocate. So again, to want to put it succinctly, number one, mammogram is a gold standard, 3D. Um, Two, make sure you follow up. Ultrasound or MRI would be the next three. And then your doctor can talk to you about others. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. And Dr. Sharon is one of the trainers and consultants that we use here at the American Cancer Society as we're going across the country, educating communities through our health equity ambassador program. Uh, And we're doing that in partnership with a number of organizations. So I want to, as we wrap up, I want to go to Wanda to talk a little bit about the caregiving piece and family members and loved ones. How do we support someone? And we only have two minutes for this, but I think it's so critically important. You know, what kind, how do we support a loved one who's going through a cancer diagnosis? Well, for one, you just got to be patient with them because they don't understand what you're going through. And with me, I just had a positive spirit about what I was going through. I walked in the doctor's office, even though I was in pain, with a a smile on my face. And my doctor said to me, you're going to live a long time because your spirit is what's keeping you here. He said, I see people come in all the time. And he said, you just have this smile. And I know you're in pain. So... I would say to just try to educate caregivers because they don't understand until they actually go through it. Yeah, patience, right? I think, you know, patience patience and grace and love, right? Yes. Yes. We, we, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's just being there, right? We don't always have the right words. We don't always know exactly what to do, but just being there. I know, you know, when I've had girlfriends and loved ones that have experienced uh, breast cancer diagnosis, it's just picking up the phone. Hey girl, thinking about you, Mm -hmm. thinking about you, stopping by with, you know, whatever it is that might make them smile. So they're just, a lot. yeah, it makes a difference. Well, ladies, you all are amazing and you all are making a difference and we thank you so much for spending the evening with us you know we're so grateful that we get to do this work in partnership with people all across the country who are really committed to 
ending cancer as we know it for everyone, right? For everyone. And we know that in the black community and in the brown community, there is a disproportionate burden of cancer. But I believe that we have come together for such a time as this and that there is something on the other side and that is victory. So I thank you so much for all that you all do to help us achieve the mission of the American Cancer Society. And I want to thank our partners. I know we've got a slide with our partners. It's coming up. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> All right. I can't see it, but I know we've got a whole lot of partners, including uh, 